Well, good morning, and welcome to Christian Life Church. If you're joining us by live stream, or you're here in the sanctuary, or in the tent area, or the overflow area, I just want to give you a warm welcome. I'm Ron Satrapi, and my wife Denise and I are senior pastors here at Christian Life Church. And I've been doing a series on the identity of a believer. How many of you have been getting something out of that? The identity of a believer. And today, I'm going to continue on this topic because I believe it's probably one of the greatest vulnerabilities of believers is our identity and every man and woman can be attacked in this area and disrupted in their walk with God more than any other area in their life it was the very weakness the devil exploited in the garden of Eden when he tempted Adam and Eve he said if you eat this forbidden fruit you'll be like God now if you read Genesis you realize that they were made in God's image and God's likeness they were already like God so there was some insecurity in their identity and thinking maybe God was holding out on them on something that, that they could have. But basically what the enemy said was, you'll be like God. You'll be able to determine good and evil without God. You'll be able to do that on your own. You'll be like God without God. And that's pretty big temptation, especially when their only identity was in God. So he displaced him from their real identity, stole their real identity and God had to send a second Adam Jesus Christ to come and restore it and we know he had the right identity because he said if you've seen me you've seen the father Jesus did not want to be God outside of the Trinity think about that how important it is for us to have an identity that is really grounded in who created us aren't you glad God made you in his image and his likeness he, he did a better job with some than others didn't he not really he did a great job God doesn't make junk you know the enemy wants to keep tempting you in this particular area and make you forget who you are my value is not in what I do my value is in whose I am but it's really tempted I've been tempted and, and I'm sure I will in the future to get back to the place where I'm trying to do things to get God's favor and God's love and God's forgiveness because that's the old motivation that we all learn by. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And that's how to overcome a performance-based identity. Where we are, what we do. I mean, think about it. It's kind of silly, isn't it? If you, if you are what you do, you could squat down and bark and you'd become a dog. But you see, that's not what God created. What, no matter what you do, you, you are still who God created. And Jesus gives us a perfect example of this. I like it. In Matthew 7 and verses 21 through 23 and he's talking to his disciples and he says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in your name and done many wonderful works in your name haven't we cast out devils in your name haven't we done many wonderful works in your name and then I will declare to them Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'm so used to the King James, sometimes I have a hard time going to a different translation. I never knew you. You, want, you know what the qualifying factor of being a true believer is? It's not that you know God. He knows you. Think about that for a minute. I don't know how many years I read this scripture, and I thought I was thinking about, well, you know, it's all about me knowing Jesus. Nope, that's half of the, of the equation. The other half is about you spending time with him and him getting to know you instead of hiding the real you from him because you fear his judgment and criticism. You fear his disapproval, lack of favor. You see, we need to understand, this is my first point this morning, we need to understand what a performance-based identity is. I grew up with one. Maybe you did too. Most of us have. The main identity requirement was not them knowing Jesus. It was Jesus knowing them. And that's really more about what he does, what he is doing, than what we're doing. And that's what dislodges us from this performance identity because our identity about, is all about what we do. If you do the right things, then you're a right person. 
If you do good things, you're a good person. If you do bad things, you're a bad person. How many of you know there's a lot of good people that do bad things? Don't look at them. I mean, there are, though. You can take my word for it. You see, it was Jesus knowing them. Does, does Jesus know you? Could he say to others, oh, yes, I know you. I know her. I know him. You see, we cannot produce good fruit outside of a relationship with Jesus. And there's nothing more dissatisfying and frustrating than us trying to do good things and right things without God. We're getting back to the old Adam and Eve thing, aren't we? It's only through a relationship with Jesus that he can know us. It's through the process of relationship that we get to know him. But it, we get to know him and he gets to know us. And we often think only about knowing him. You see, relationship is knowing and being known. It's not just knowing. You see, it's very possible from what the Scripture teaches us to have a relationship that is only who's ours, not whose we are. Think about that for a minute. It's all about God's being there for me. How about being there for God? And I think that the vital relational part of whose we are can be missing. I think sometimes we think about peace for us. We're thinking about who he is for us. We're not thinking about who we are for him. And I, I think we can have that one-way relationship that we're so used to because we grew up in a family of dysfunctional people that we think that that's the way it is with God. No, that's not the way it is with God. Jesus said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Well, what do you mean he never knew you? You're not acting in the identity you were created to act in. And that identity can only be birthed in you through relationship with him. So it's very possible from this scripture that we can have a, quote, unquote, who's ours relationship instead of who who's we are. So do you have a, that two-way relationship? You see, I think that Jesus was speaking to these people that their whole relationship was based, well, I cast out devils, I did many wonderful things, I did all these works in your name, and Jesus said, that doesn't mean you have a relationship with me. That doesn't mean I know you. Do you think what you do for me tells me who you are, or do you think you tell me who you are when we have time together? Do you think you're telling me who you are when we, we don't have time together? He compares relationship between him and his followers to the relationship of a vine and its connecting branches. These relational connections are so important because if you don't develop the relational connections, you'll never be able to produce the fruit that God wants you to produce in your life. Goodness and love and kindness and meekness and joy. And Jesus said it this way. In John 15, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me. How many branches? Every branch in me. Every person connected relationally to me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you. Boy, haven't we tried. Unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do very little. Is that what it says? Nothing. Wow. How come I'm not seeing much happening in my relationship with God? How's your connection? And not much happens without a connection. Now, he uses a very relational word here, a term, abide. They don't really use that a lot nowadays in, in our time. But in the Greek, this word abide, you know what it meant? It meant to stay 
in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Continue, dwell, endure, be present. I'll tell you one thing about being married. My wife makes it known to me how important it is for me to be present when I'm there. Oh, if you're there, you're present. No. Especially nowadays with all the technology and everything, it's easy to be there and be far away from present. Isn't that true? Jesus said that outside of relationship that's developed by abiding in him, we can do nothing. Why are we so busy doing nothing? Think about it. Sometimes we're just distracting ourselves from spending time with God because we get the wrong idea about how God feels about us. And instead of spending time with God because we know he has love for us and great favor for us and great desire for us, we're thinking he has judgment and guilt and shame and condemnation. We project something on God that really isn't there. That's why we have to have the right identity. I'm important to God not because I behaved this week, not because I did everything he asked me to do, but because I'm his. Same way it is with your children. You know, you, you love your kids. I've joked sometimes and said grandkids is a reward you get for not killing yours. But you know, the fact of the matter is, your kids are your kids. You're going to love them no matter what. They may embarrass the dickens out of you. And I could tell some stories, but they watch this program too. So I'm going to leave a little bit to the imagination, all right? And my parents, they had their stories too. You see, outside of a relationship, you know what we try to do? We try to be a good person. If someone told, asked me before I was a, a Christian, if, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? I said, yeah, I'm a good person. You see, that's not Christianity. That's religion. It's about what I do. It's not about who, whose I am. It's about what I, well, didn't Jesus say that you had to do these good works. What he said was, is you don't do works without them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He didn't say not to do good works. He said, do it together with him. Without me, you can do nothing. Outside of relationship with him, we start to just try to be a good person. I think today I'm just going to try not to sin. Good luck. How many of you know it's futile? Because it's performance-based. It's not relationally based. As we follow him by faith, our relationship with him is really a relationship with faith. We believe he's there. And you know what I notice? When I believe he's there, he's there. And when I don't believe he's there, I'm not there. It's not that he isn't. <laughs> we wither outside of a relationship with him. And trials, you know what they're for? They come to draw us back to God. Draw us back into relationship. The fire is what God uses to burn up the things that we've been involved in that aren't him, the things that we are distracted from him with and from a relationship with him and that reduces our fruitfulness. That's what this scripture says in John 15. My second point this morning is that we, we must develop a faith-based identity. Not works-based, not performance-based, a faith-based. If anyone does not abide in me, as he is cast out as a branch and, and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By my Father, who is glorified, that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Now, what's this talking about? I'll tell you exactly what it's talking about. You hear a lot about burnout. You know what burnout is? It's trying to do things without God. Doing things that God doesn't want you to do, but you, there's an expectation that maybe other people want you to do it, or maybe there's an expectation that, that in order for you to be a good person, you've got to do these things. In order for you to be a good employee, you've got to do these things. In order for you to be a good whatever, what are you doing? Idolatry. You're making your own idol. You're making yourself to be something that can only happen with God's involvement and God's help. In our relationship with God, by faith, we read his word, and you know what? He speaks to our spirit. 
By faith, we abide in him, and he's revealed in us. By faith, he produces fruit through us. You never hear a plant moaning and groaning trying to produce fruit, do you? No, it's an automatic thing. When you spend time with God, fruit's going to grow in your life. Good things are going to happen in your life. But when we pray for what we desire, he gives us what we desire when we're with him. It's in relationship with him that he knows the desires of our hearts, and he shares our joy when he grants those desires and answers our prayers. We can only keep his commands when we hear them in relationship. There's nothing worse than trying to do what's written instead of hear what's written. Faith comes by hearing, not doing. That happens after. You see, only through abiding relationship can we know and receive God's unconditional love. I'm going to tell you, it's such an awesome thing to be loved regardless of whether you're lovable. God loves me just like I am, and he loves me too much to leave me that way. Isn't he awesome? Don't we serve an awesome God, really? You see, good fruit doesn't gain God's love. Good fruit is produced by being loved by God. Sometimes we get the cart before the horse. We're trying to do things to be loved instead of doing things because we're loved. Because that's the way God created us to be. John 15 and verse 9 and 10, it says, As my Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. Now I want you to understand something here. You cannot keep God's commands alone. Remember, Adam and Eve tried that already. It's through abiding in him, hearing his voice. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we abide in him, it's not things in a book we're trying to, to live out. It's the word of God being spoken to our heart, and with that comes power, because the word of God is quick and powerful and able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit. What's that talking about? The word of God gives you the power to do things your soul could never do, because you're being led by your spirit, empowered by your spirit. He didn't say do the commandments. You got to get this. If you, what? Keep my commands. Keep my commandments. This is a real revelation to me as a new Christian when I realized, because I was all about doing, you know, I had the Batman theme, do, 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 do. And that was the way I had been living my life, and that's the way I continue to live my life as a Christian. And then I, I come across this scripture, and he said, keep my commandments. He didn't say do, why didn't he say do my commandments? Why did he say keep my commandments? He said, keep. He didn't say do. And it's really important, you know, you really got to get a hold of this. Because that word keep means to hold on to. What are you talking about? Hold on to what God says. No matter how many times you fail, keep holding on to it. Because you see, it's a, it's a group, it's a joint venture between you and God. And as you hold on to God's word, and you keep watering that word, regardless of whether you fail to perform it or not, God will begin to give life to the dead. And you'll do things you never thought you could do. You see, we ultimately do what we've been holding on to in our hearts. Hold on to God's word in your heart. Make, make it your home. Make God's word your home in your heart. Abide in it. Yeah, but you see, Pastor, when I read these things and I'm not doing them, then I feel guilty and I feel like God doesn't love me yeah, because you think you have to do to be loved instead of you have to love to do. You have to experience God's love to do what God's word says. With performance-based identity, we start believing we have to obey God before we can be loved and accepted. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't have to love God. What I'm saying is, is that you don't have to love God for him to love you. You don't have to obey God for him to obey you. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Without God's love and acceptance, folks, we cannot obey him. It's just a venture in a, a failed venture in the flesh, isn't it? Faith-based identity is believing that Christ has made us loved and accepted and approved. Yeah, but you don't realize, I've done this and I've done that and this is going on in my life and that's going on. Yep, and God loves you. And if it's ever going to change, it's going to change because you believe that God loves you enough to help you change. We are loved because of who we are, not because of what we do. I want you to say that with me. I am loved because of whose I am, not because of what I do. Psalm 103, I like this one. Know the Lord, he is good. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Oh, I love this scripture. It's he who has, quit trying to make yourself. Spend time with him, he'll make you into something you'd never, ever recognize as being who you are compared to who you were that he recognizes, and if we'll spend time with him, we'll see ourselves as different people, the people that God can make us to be. We can only change our behavior through relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. Remember Jesus said all the things that he did, and even the supernatural things, he did because he always pleased the Father. He was doing what the Father told him to do. What's God telling you to do? You know, we're living in a time right now, there's a lot of fear. What's going to happen and everything with this whole pandemic and the economy and all the riots and everything that's going on and you know should we store food or should we what should we do move to a different place or, or have a hideaway place or have a bag to pack in case of an emergency and leave and you know all those things are great for emergencies but there's nothing that replaces having a relationship with God where God tells you what to do and he tells you what to do the, the thing is is if we think it's all about doing we don't take time to hear what he's saying What's God say I do? You see, he's perfecting that, which concerns me. It ain't all on me. Take a deep breath and look at someone and say, it's not on me. King David knew that. He, he wrote Psalm 138 that says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Man, don't he have a job. Come on, be honest. Boy, God's got a job on his hands. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. It has to if he's going to perfect that which concerns me. Do not forsake the works of your hands. What's he saying to him? I'm a work of your hands. Don't forsake the work of your hands. Lord, I'm over here, and I'm feeling really incomplete. Those hands need to get busy. <laughs> change behavior is the result of a change plant. There's a new plant in you that's born of the incorruptible seed of God's word. And that plant, when it's nurtured and watered, produces fruit. Boy, that's good news. Plants, like relationship, they have to have a relationship with the soil. They have to be cultivated, watered, and fed. It's a daily thing with a plant. It's not a big day thing. Why do we judge our relationship with God by a day or an event or something that happened that maybe was devastating? Only by knowing him will we know our true identity because he made us and he made us in his image and in his likeness. You're always going to be on an emotional roller coaster when you base your identity on your performance. Mama said there'll be days like this. There'll be days like this. My mama said we have good days. We have bad days. We have up days. We have down days. We have all kind of days, holidays. You name it. And you're going to be on a roller coaster. You're doing, you're doing good today, so you're up. Not doing so good, now you're down. Your approval with God is based upon whether you're doing good or not doing good instead of Jesus did all the good necessary for God to love you. Whether or not you have a good day, it's not going to depend on you doing 
what you wanted to do and feeling affirmed because the activity that you did well at today what did it do it reinforced your identity and that's the problem we shouldn't try to perform better yeah we should but not to get his love Ooh, there's a big difference there you, you thought I was gonna let you off the hook and say you don't have to do anything good you know sometimes we miss the mark maybe the laundry is stacked up and your goals aren't being accomplished and not anywhere near as fast as you plan you don't have as much for retirement as you were hoping you would or maybe you miss the quotas at work or maybe you feel depressed insecure and your sense of self-worth is in the gutter you see all of this results from a performance-based identity my goodness you mean I can feel good about myself all the time you're getting it you want to see how this really improves your relationship with God it's amazing we usually end up taking our insecurities out on our friends and our family when we're feeling down we'll be to him like the guy that got in trouble at work and came home and screamed at his wife and his wife screamed at the kid and the kid went and kicked the dog he should have just come home and kicked the dog and gave everyone else a break for ministers, you know, the, the quality of our Mondays can be connected to how well things, we think things went on Sunday. And there's a temptation to measure success by what we call weekend metrics. You know, things like church attendance, how many came. Would it be a lot of down and dump pastors now, wouldn't there, huh? With the pandemic. How many people made commitments to Christ and how many people were water baptized and been the longest time since we've been a church that we haven't had water baptisms because of the pandemic these are all important things I'm not saying they're not and they're good to track but if you look to them for your identity it's always going to produce a broken heart because in the eyes of the leader it's never going to be enough ever I can remember going to some pastors conferences and there'd be pastors with tens of thousands of people there'd be pastors with a thousand people and 500 people and I'd have 150 200 people and I'd kind of go in there like the underdog you know feeling like you know I'm no good because I'm not doing anything like these people are doing things and the fact of the matter is they're not doing what they're doing because there's something it's because they understand God is and they're making that known to others what it really all boils down to that when we have a performance-based identity it really is all about me because it's about what I do and that leads to what's next what I do compared to what you do hmm well if you die right now would you go to heaven yeah I haven't killed anybody oh you're comparing yourself to a murderer what well, I didn't think of that what if you compared yourself to Jesus well oh man I'd bust hell wide open you see it boils down to what you do who you are doesn't have anything to do with it that's performance based identity it leads to what's next comparison comparing yourself the Bible says it's unwise instead of looking to Jesus within you you look to those around you for validation good sermon pastor mm, I'm feeling good already and there are people you know you preach that sermon better than T.D. Jakes oh really you see you don't need that when you know that your validation comes from the one within it's not something without you see we won't when we begin to compare we commit we begin to compete and if people are doing better than us that we begin to criticize that's where all that leads to it doesn't go anywhere you really want to go either that or you become indifferent you become suspicious if anyone's doing better than you they must be cheating or compromising in some way I like what President Ted, Teddy Roosevelt said comparison is the thief of joy quit comparing your identity is not in your work it's not in your ministry it's not in the roles you play at home mama good mama good daddy it's really in Christ Galatians 2 20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me it's all about him and I'm an object of his affection you can never find enough affirmation from the externals of performance 
to satisfy. You're going to be driven. You're, you're always going to have to do more and more and more and more and more. It won't be about any type of satisfaction of being his. I want you to understand something. Being more does not replace being his. It doesn't scratch the itch. It doesn't fill the God-shaped hole inside of us. And how do you, how do you keep your identity in Christ? Well, you have to come back next week so I can tell you. Are you getting something out of this? I think it's really important that we recognize the false equation we, many of us live by. What is that false equation? My performance plus other people's opinion of me equals my self-worth. It doesn't. Have you gotten off track in your relationship with God by having a performance-based identity? Have you been stuck in the performance trap? I have. Caused me to be depressed for about two years. Trying to be good enough to be loved and accepted by God. It'll run you to death. After a while, you might even just quit. Thinking that, that you just can't, so why bother? Well, Jesus bothered. And the harder you try, the more you prove you don't believe it. It will squeeze the life right out of you. You've got to turn from it and turn to a faith-based identity where you believe that God loves you unconditionally because Jesus shed his blood and paid the price for your reconciliation. He and he alone makes you acceptable to God. Look at someone tell him he's, he's more than enough. The cross is enough. If you really realize that you need to return to a faith-based identity, I'd like us this, we bow our heads in prayer. If that's you, say, Pastor, that's what I need to do. Pray for me. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand, Pastor, pray for me. Oh, praise God. Hands going up everywhere. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross, shed his blood to pay for my sins, and make me acceptable to you. Jesus, come into my life. Make me a new person with a new identity. I receive you, and I receive your identity right now. My sins are leaving me. I'm becoming a new creation. I give you the old me, and I receive the new me that's made in your likeness. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, you could let me know so that I could be praying for you. Because when you do pray a prayer like that, the enemy's right out trying to pull you back down. You can fill out a, one of our Connect cards on our app by going to the More tab and then click Connect Card. And under Comments, let me know that you prayed and if you have any other prayer requests that you might have, put those down in there too. By filling out that Connect card, we can send you the teaching notes for every Sunday before the service. As we prepare to give our offering, I want to ask if you were here in the sanctuary and you need an offering envelope, if you raise your hands, the ushers will bring you one. And if you'd like to give financially to support our ministry so that it can continue, then you can give on our app by going to the More tab and select Give. Or you can go to the website by going to the Give tab, click the donation on the drop-down, and you can also give by texting. You can text G-I-V-E-C-L-C to 1-888-364-GIVE, G-I-V-E. You can also send a check or credit card, you can pay by credit card, in the mail to Christian Life Church, 775 Harold L. Dow Highway in Elliott, Maine. Now today I want to share a little bit about what we give to the Lord. Did you know your, your giving is a reflection of you? When I give, it reflects that I trust that God is going to bless me. That when I give, you know Jesus was an offering. He was a seed sown into the ground. And more of his kind came up, and you're one of those. And when we sow a seed into the kingdom of God, there's going to be people coming to the kingdom because we sowed a seed. I think one of the most important things I ever learned was from a minister named Oral Roberts. And he wrote a book about seed faith. And we pretty much lived our life based on that seed faith that we would sow a seed and God would give us what we need. And he'd give us more than we need. And God wants to do the same for you, but 
It doesn't happen without a seed sown in faith. It's not just sowing a seed, it's sowing it in faith. Well, why do you sow a seed? To get a harvest. Anybody here need a harvest? I believe there's some people here that need jobs. Maybe some that are watching by stream or on a rat or in the tent. And as you sow a seed, target it toward what you need. You see, we have a garden at home. Not a big one, but enough to have some fresh vegetables in the summertime. And when we sow a seed, you can put them in little pods and they grow up. But you know, I've never put in a squash seed that ended up becoming a cucumber. You see, when we sow a seed, we need to target. What are you, what are you targeting? By faith. Maybe you need to make a mortgage payment you had not been able to make. Hey, see what God can do. He's done that for us many times. There's a lot of people in need right now, and the last place they often look to is God. And that's the first place we ought to look. As we give to the Lord today, let's pray over the offering and ask God to bless this seed that we're about to, to sow. Can, can you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this offering that we're about to give today. We want to faithfully support your kingdom's work so that we can continue to see it thrive. In Jesus' mighty name, bless it and multiply this seed. Amen. I want to encourage those of you that might have gotten behind on giving. Maybe you're still watching us by stream and you, you haven't felt that comfortable yet coming back into a live service. That doesn't mean that you can't continue to support and give. If there's anything we need to be ready for right now is what may come unexpectedly and sowing seed, it doesn't matter what's coming my way, God's going to meet my need. I'm still going to have a harvest. It doesn't matter if the currency fails, I'm going to have a harvest. It doesn't matter if the government changes, I'm going to have a harvest. I want to thank you for joining us today. If you're here in the sanctuary or in the overflow tent or you're watching by live stream, if you'd like to visit us for a live service, you can make a reservation by our app by going to the event tab, and you'll see first service or second service. Or if you get our weekly email, you can respond by clicking the reservation button or by calling our office at 207-449-3824. The first 50 people can meet in the sanctuary for each service and the next 50 in the overflow tent. We can only have 100 reservations in each service. So I'd encourage you to do that, and if you're, you're, you're here regularly, I encourage you to, to, to continue to do that weekly. To our live stream audience, I want to thank you for being with us this morning. Please know that you're in our hearts and in our prayers, and we look forward to being able to be with you in person soon. Be sure to keep us posted on any prayer requests that you may have. Until we see you next week, be a live stream. God bless you. And amen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Church Online today. You can catch the playback of this entire broadcast later on today on Facebook or YouTube. Or if you want to download the entire broadcast on Tuesday, you can get it on our church app found as Christian Life Church Maine in your app store. Guys, you're important and you matter to us and we want to stay connected to you. So if you have a prayer request, if you want someone to reach out to you, if you need information or if you want to join any of our Zoom group chats that are going to happen throughout the week, then just shoot us an email at citlchurches.com and we'd be happy to get you the information and connect with you. I know it might be easy to feel a little isolated in our homes during this challenging season, but we want you to know that you are never isolated or cut off from the love of God and from His power and protection. And we're praying that you will stay connected to Him and to us all week long. Be blessed, everybody. May God's going to bless the work of your hands. Amen.